Good morning. Uh, I'm going to share a song with you that I wrote a while back about a um, little coffee house in Mishawaka. Oh, I forgot I got to turn this up. I'm looking at him and it's me. <laughs> little coffee house in Mishawaka, Indiana called Eclectic Circle. I don't know if anybody remembers that, but it was full of high school kids and the owner was named Tim, kind of an old hippie. And Tim let them come in there and smoke cigarettes and curse and, and they drew all over the tables and the walls and it was kind of an interesting place, but it made me think of people coming together and having discussions and maybe not always seeing eye to eye. Drawings on the table Drawings on the wall Please explain the symbolism But don't explain it all Filtered or unfiltered Blue talk fills the air On reason, reasons with reason Loyalty turns into treason Don't try to understand it Don't try to escape from it Don't try to trivialize it Don't try to exaggerate it Just float away on a cloud of shadows and shade Fade away to the red and gray Those shadows and shade Fade away to the red and gray Try to understand it. Don't try to escape from it. Don't try to trivialize it. Don't try to exaggerate it. Just float away on a cloud of shadows and shade. Fade away. Fade away into the red and gray those shadows and shades Fade away into the red and gray those shadows and shades Fade away into the red and gray Good morning. Good morning. I assume this is on? Yes, it is. My name is Steve Kripe, and my, I'm a member of the Board of Trustees of this congregation. Good morning to you all. The Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of Elkhart is a welcoming community 
We encourage religious freedom, nurture individual spiritual and ethical growth, celebrate diversity, and promote contributing to a just and sustainable world. If you would like to learn more about you, this fellowship, please check our website at uufe.org and join us after the service for our coffee hour through the art gallery and the, and the gathering place in the back. For the listening and enjoyment of, of all, we ask you now to please turn your cell phones off to vibrate if possible. If any of you need hearing support, you can check with the sound booth in the back of the sanctuary for assistance there. Before I sit down, I need to say a few thank yous for yesterday. We had to clean up the semi-annual, or semi-monthly, no, semi-annual, spring and fall. Um, Holly and Alexander Reed, Jenny Hopper, Pam and Don Wycliffe, Elizabeth, Elizabeth and Alex Blackwell, all showed up, and, and uh, Dwight and Oksana came by at the very end and checked to make sure everything was okay and everything was done, <laughs> and we, we were all done. But uh, it was a good afternoon. We, we were lucky because with the, the Meyer construction, that wasn't real dirty down through there, so we didn't have to do the whole road, but we were shorthanded, but we got done by about uh, 3 o'clock in the afternoon. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Good morning. My name is Linda Becker. I'm a member of the congregation, and I'm going to share fellowship life with everyone. And there's quite a few announcements, so hold on to your seats here. Um, today, the meditation group will be meeting, but they are not meeting in the Learning Center. They are going to be meeting in this building, and I believe it's downstairs, and you can check with Ken. Uh, on Thursday, there's yoga class, and it meets here at 6 o'clock in the gathering place, and this is every Thursday. Science and Society will meet this Tuesday and to discuss and view Sir David Attenborough's film, A Life, let's see, A Life on Our Planet, uh, which, like all of Attenborough's films, is fascinating. And if you have an opportunity, please join them at Science and Society. Wednesdays, the Feasters are going to meet at 1130 at the Mayberry Cafe. Um, be sure to let Mary Adams know today if you're planning on attending or enjoying. Um, the Heart of the Circle pa uh, Pagans Cups Group will host a Samhain celebration to prepare for their new year on Saturday. Uh, they're going to gather at 5 o'clock in the evening with a ritual at 530 followed by a, a supper potluck afterwards. And there is more information in the focus. The membership committee um, will hold new UU classes on Saturday, November 12th and the 19th um, for both new and not so new friends and members of UUFE. If you'd like more information, please contact Annette Long, our membership chair sitting right over here. And uh, she has more information. Worship and Arts is looking for musicians. Um, we're casting, we, they, are casting their net for anyone within the fellowship who could play uh, an instrument or sing uh, for our gathering music services. Um, whether you sing or play, um, please let one of the members of the committee know, and that would be Joan Claiborne, Laura Snow, Lorna Lane, Oksana, or Chuck Bauer. And... I didn't, I didn't, it was out of here. And Genio, yeah. We've got a great mem uh, committee there, so let somebody know. Love to read, um, want to stretch your mind. The Society of Radical Readers is for you, starting on Friday, November 4th at 7. Um, they will be discussing their frequently, frequently banned adult, young adult novel, um, All American Boys by Jason Reynolds and Brendan Keeley. Um, if you want more information, please contact Laura Snow here in the back. Did you have an addition? No. Nope. Oh, okay, Laura's in the back. Laura's in the back. Uh, Worship and Arts. Uh, Worship and Arts wants to thank everyone who completed the survey for their feedback. It's been very valuable. Um, 
and if you need additional forms until the end of the month, uh, Chuck Bauer has other forms. Also for with Worship and Arts on November 20th, they will have, we will have here our traditional bread communion service. You may bring a special bread to the service and have an opportunity to briefly share its importance to you. Then in, in December, we're planning a Christmas Eve service on Saturday night, the 24th, and on Sunday, the 25th. Laura Snow will coordinate the potluck carry-in on Christmas Day. And there will not be a service on, no service on Christmas Day, just the potluck, okay. Uh, more t details will be in the focus. They're also looking for some musicians to offer some gathering music on Christmas Day, and perhaps the evening before. Also on the island is our sign-up sheet for trick or treat, uh, trunk or treat on Halloween from, no, on Halloween, the Halloween party on Sunday the 30th uh, from five to seven. Um, everyone's invited, and they will be accepting a free donation at the party so that they will have a nest egg to host another party in December. So that's the mystery party, because I don't know any more about it than that. <laughs> um, last week, uh, we had a collection of $147, which will be shared with the Elkhart Women's Shelter. This week's collection will go to the Jail Chaplaincy Fund. And one more, and then I'm going to turn this over to Ken. Uh, the focus deadline is October 25th. Is that... Today? Yeah. Oh, Tuesday? Yeah. Okay, that's the focus uh, deadline is on the 25th. And that's it. Here's Ken. Thank you. Hi, I asked Linda to give me a minute or two. Um, I wanted to explain why we're moving the um, meditation group to the basement. Uh, we discovered recently that we had a serious leak in the children's house in the basement, and there is, we've discovered uh, black mold in there in the basement. Even though we don't meet in the basement, uh, to be super cautious, we decided to move the meditation group and ask others who may be meeting in there um, to please either refrain from doing that, find another location, or wear your masks because it's not a safe place to be, okay? Thank you so much. Hi, I'm Mary Perrin. And when I signed up for this musing, I sat down and wrote some things out. I went to a quote book and I found one by John Dewey that said, the heart and strength of the democratic way of living are the processes of effective give and take communications, of conference, of consultation, of exchange and pooling of experiences, of free conversation, if you will. This quote stimulated the memory of what was one of the most rewarding life's work that I did, and that was teaching effective parenting classes for well over 20 years. Briefly, its contents were encouragement instead of praising and criticizing, paying attention to one's own feelings, and those under the words and actions of others by reflective listening, using I messages to describe the effects of another's actions on self rather than blaming, allowing children and other people to experience natural and logical consequences of their own actions when not a real danger instead of being punitive and as a group, exploring possible alternatives as a way to resolve difficult situations. These processes are based on democratic principles that promote trust. Our UUU covenant fits these human relations skills, and that is what drew me to UUFA. I almost 
tore this up last night and decided to speak extemporaneously, and I will have an addendum to that. I spent 12 hours yesterday reading Where the Crawdads Sing because I had seen the movie and I wanted to see if it followed it. And all of a sudden, it dawned on me, these democratic principles don't work for people who have lost any reason to trust anyone in the world. So I just hope that you'll take this into consideration. We ring the gong three times, once for those who came before us and made a place for us. Once for those who are here now. And once for those who will follow us and build on the dream. Our chalice lighting this morning is from John Gibb Miltzbaugh. This morning, leave aside the little thoughts that distract you. For this place, like all places, is a holy place. And now, like all times, is a holy time. Join with this community of seekers, and together, let us find. Please join me in the unison covenant that is printed in your order of service. Love is the spirit of this church, and service is its law. To dwell together in peace, to seek the truth and love, and to help one another. This is our covenant. In a moment, we will be taking up our offering. And the offertory today is specially chosen, both sides now, an instrumental version. And it's on the long side. Um, so please use that time for meditation.
number 108 in the teal hymnal. And Steve Kripe is going to help guide us through when our heart is in a holy place. For those of you that are not familiar with this hymnal, you got a lot of page turning to do. And after the third verse, you'll notice at the top of the second page of the little quota mark, you'll go right from there and go to the last page at the very last score to end it. So that's the only thing you got to watch for. After the third verse, you're going to skip a page then and jump to the end. And I'll help you along there. Let's stand if you're willing and able to sing this. We are so glad to have today's speaker with us, and we are also very pleased to have Lee Burdorf here to introduce her. They've been friends for years, and I thought it quite lovely to have Lee introduce her, and Lee being one of our very newest members of UUFE. I'm Lee, that would be me. Uh, <laughs> hi, everybody. Uh, before we get started on this, I wanted to mention, I have a few of you have asked me about uh, the disappearance of the church mascot. Uh, I haven't seen uh, Zachary since Thursday morning, so hopefully he's found a happy place. He never really was my cat. He, uh, I think he belonged to the church, but uh, hopefully he's followed somebody home and, uh, and uh, things will turn out nice. Okay, well, maybe we'll maybe he'll show up next Sunday morning, and we'll uh, we'll see him. Thank you, Janiel. I wish if if everybody worked as hard as Janiel does in this congregation, we'd we'd have a, a wonderful place, and we still have a wonderful place. April Odensky is uh, is who I'm supposed to be talking about here, and April and I have been knowing each other over 20 years. Uh, she and her husband Ken Smith and and a few other hearty souls joined with me uh, about 20 years ago. And uh, how many years ago, Ken? 2001. 2001. So it's, uh, we started a little radio program uh, of listener commentaries that, uh, Michiana Chronicles. You, you, most of you listen to public radio and, uh, and you know about it. And, uh, 
and I've remained friends with uh, Ken and April uh, through the years. In fact, I had dinner at their house Wednesday night, and, uh, and it's great to see them both here to, with me today. But, uh, uh, it's, it's amazing that uh, Michiana Chronicles is still going very strong, and it's uh, a credit to Ken and April and the, and the work they put into it, and, uh, and uh, I'm very happy about that, that it's, uh, it's outlasted me. All I ever did was turn on their mics anyway, so... <laughs> so. Uh, April is more than just a, a pretty voice on the radio. She has a PhD, and uh, she's a longtime honored member of the faculty at IUSB. And uh, and uh, it's it's uh, great to have her with us this morning. Uh, she's her specialty is gender studies, which is uh, something I think all America needs to know a lot more about. And uh, I think she's going to touch a little on that today and, and then talk about it. But, uh, but that's, that's the thing. She's one of the funniest people I know. <laughs> she can always make me laugh. And she's one of the busiest people I know. She always is juggling about 12 projects. And uh, April is not the kind of person who just supports something. She gets out and walks the walk and talks the talk and, and lets you know what she wants to do to make... Uh, the world a better place, and uh, and uh, she's going to make our church a better place today. Uh, my my buddy April Lizinski. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's great. You need to squeeze first. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That was lovely. So what Lee didn't say is his most recent task with me is um, he's my Mini Cooper mentor. So I just inherited a pristine 2003 metallic gold Mini Cooper that my mother bought um, and kept not just in a garage but under a baby blanket <laughs> in the garage and now I am driving it. I inherited it and have had to relearn standard transmission. So um, it's almost back but I still have some moments driving for Ken is occasionally saying, Yes, now would be a good time to shift. <laughs> when, you, when you hear the car making that sound, I'm like, oh, that's right. So, um, all right. Um, so thank you so much for giving me time today. And thank you especially to Janiel and all of you who have organized such a beautiful service. Um, Mary's um, comments at the beginning certainly are going to, you're going to really hear the way they harmonize what I have to, with what I have to say. And... Uh, Carl's music at the beginning and that beautiful version of Both Sides Now, just uh, perfect. Thank you so much. And I also want to thank um, the, the congregation here for agreeing via Janiel to donate the honorarium for today to Hoosier Abortion Funds. So I'm happy to say a little bit more about that in our discussion time, how people can be useful. Um, it's not all that glamorous, but really one of the most powerful things that those of us without uh, either nursing or physician background to do right now is to donate money to support those in need. So thank you for that. Um, and it's also just nice to see so many old friends here, so, uh, and maybe some new ones by the end of our time together. So, um, Janiel asked me to speak for about 20 minutes. I timed this at 19 minutes and 30 seconds. So, um, I just wanted to let you know, because there's always a worry when someone new is at the podium and you think, oh God, <laughs> how long will this go on? So, 19 minutes and 30 seconds is how long it will go on. So I want to share a bit this morning about what I'm learning from conversations about abortion. But really, I'm going to talk about what it's like to talk about a divisive issue in a time of fear and worry. I'll share some of my own experiences and also some insights from an oral history project that I'm doing with people who organized for abortion in our community pre-Roe, so pre-1973. And I'll alert you now that while the stories I'm going to share are studded with stumbles, these are not depressing stories. Far from it, to my mind. It turns out that when people make the effort to connect with one another on a serious issue or trust others enough to have a challenging conversation, pleasure is often a surprising result. So I have been a a volunteer for Planned Parenthood for more than 20 years, and I know Annette and uh, Gordon and Phyllis from that kind of rabble-rousing 
Um, but I really dove headfirst into reproductive justice organizing in 2015 when I helped start the Michiana Access Volunteer Advocacy Group, which fundraised to bring the Whole Woman's Health clinic model to South Bend. Whole Woman's Health, the brainchild of CEO Amy Hagstrom Miller, has a feminist structure focusing on patient self-determination as they make the momentous decision about whether or not to continue a pregnancy. We invited Amy and her team to South Bend in 2015 to get to know us so that they could make the momentous decision about whether to invest in our community with a clinic. On a snowy February night, we gathered around a supper table, steam rising from roasted chicken and vegetables, and candlelight warming the faces of retired physicians and activists and the college-age founders of Pro-Choice South Bend. As we ate, Amy Hagstrom Miller ad asked us why we were devoting our time to abortion advocacy. I hadn't really thought about it before beyond, somebody's gotta do this, it's a hard issue, but I know how to do hard work. It felt like an obligation to me, maybe even a burden that I felt I should shoulder because I was tenured at a public university and my livelihood was not in danger. And I'll note that that is not true for many of the people I do organizing with. I don't remember what I said that night, but I certainly remember Amy's own response. She said, I think it is an honor to sit with a woman while she charts the course of her life. She was upbeat, positive. Her undergraduate career, or her undergraduate degree is in religious studies. And I could hear how that holistic spiritual framework led her to this approach to abortion care. I could also hear a theme that weaves through the oral histories that I'm gathering, the value of destigmatizing reproductive health care, all parts of it, from menstruation to birth control, miscarriage, infertility, stillbirth, menopause, by talking about it. Those human connections, so humane, are so much better than the silence and loneliness of shame. That conversation changed the way I thought about abortion advocacy and helped me see that women's self-determination was not only good for them, it was good for families and communities. In between that initial conversation with Amy Hagstrom Miller in 2015 and when we were finally able to open the clinic in 2019, we walked a difficult road due to realtors and contractors who didn't want to risk association with abortion. And if people are interested in hearing about that, I can, I can talk about that a little bit afterwards. And then of course in 2016, Trump was elected to office. And so I found myself co-organizing the 2017 Women's March in South Bend, one of the hundreds of sister marches across the nation and globe, in addition to the huge march in Washington, D.C. How many people here participated in a march one place or another? Yeah, I am unsurprised. Go Unitarians. <laughs> you are my people. So. Um, <laughs> As the contact person for our local event, I fielded lots of questions in the days leading up to the march, including several people who asked if pro-life women were welcome at our event. Now the national platform was explicitly pro-choice since one of the concerns was control over the Supreme Court. We were right to be concerned. But locally, we decided on a bigger tent policy I told people that if they were moved to participate in support of women, they were welcome. Not everybody agreed with me on this, I'll just say, but that was sort of the, it wasn't exactly a consensus, but that's where we ended up. And so on an unseasonably warm January day, we drew over 4,000 marchers, and a handful of marchers did indeed carry signs that said, pro-life and pro-women. Those signs sparked a lot of discussions that day, most of which I was not privy to. But maybe the sunshine made us optimists. What I heard back was positive. I ended up following up with two of the sign holders who are members of the local Right to Life group and who are, like me, writers and mothers. I invited them over to my house. I anxiously overperformed femininity by baking too many snacks. <laughs> And, I brainstormed about, uh, and we brainstormed about a column that we could write together for the South Bend Tribune about finding common ground. I was prepared with more than my muffins and scones. 
I had statistics from the Guttmacher Institute about how common abortion is and who seeks abortions, and that is, as you probably know, people from all political and religious traditions, atheists, people from every social class, every racial and ethnic group. I had ideas about comprehensive sex ed that we could bring to our community and case studies about long-term birth control that dramatically dropped rates of unplanned and unwanted pregnancies. They gently let me know that what I imagined could be common ground wasn't. They had stats of their own and they just didn't believe mine. But nicely, <laughs> they were not proponents of birth control or comprehensive sex ed, but somehow the conversation was still funny, friendly, as we licked muffin crumbs off our fingers and ended up talking about parenting, writing, and favorite novels. The column that we co-wrote ended up being about how we really couldn't find common ground on abortion, but we were committed to the process and finding other kinds of common ground, and that we found pleasure in those conversations. We ended our column with the following short paragraphs, quote, we learn much from one another through the difficult, necessary art of listening, by choosing collaboration over criticism, dialogue over division. What do we fear? What do we hope for? Where do our causes overlap? We know we cannot magically convert one another to a different standpoint about deeply held beliefs. However, we discover shared goals. For example, we share commitments to reducing violence in women's lives and supporting families in need. Ultimately, the power of our activism depends on broad consensus, which requires mutual trust. Meeting face to face, we must listen carefully, prioritizing the relationship above the message. This lays the groundwork for collective successful action, uh, for successful collective action, end quote, end column. And I'll just say writing this was such a funny experience because we had a shared Google Doc, and I don't know how many of you have co-written something in a Google Doc, but it was like something out of Harry Potter where I would be writing a sentence and someone would be, someone would be erasing it from the other end. And <laughs> <laughs> It was a sort of three-dimensional wild ride, but you know, it was it was funny and sweet at the same time. Um, took a, took us a while. <laughs> so those conversations were more fun and more delicious than assuming that the other side is one-dimensional or unreflective. Once again, those humane connections feel so much better than silence or anger. The unexpected pleasures of one-on-one -on -one connections is a consistent theme in my oral history project on abortion advocacy in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s. So I'm conducting these interviews with Notre Dame sociology doctoral student, Eli Williams, who is a Unitarian in the South Bend congregation and just a gem of a human being. So um, I'll share a few insights from a couple of those interviews from women who have given us permission to use their names. So first, Charlotte Pfeiffer, a well-known black leader in South Bend who is 74. I like your nod, Pam. She's like, oh yeah. Anything, anything uh, progressive in our community in South Bend uh, has been touched in some way by Charlotte Pfeiffer. She's just remarkable. So for decades, she has been a change agent in local connection, in local corrections, in city government, where she helped ensure passing of the local human rights ordinance to protect to protect LGBTQ plus folks. She is a lifelong Christian and is often, as she says, the only black person in the room. She said she was born at the right time to take advantage of the doors opened by the civil rights movement and the women's liberation movement of the 1970s. While the white feminist movement doesn't speak to her, womanism, taking race into account, does. Charlotte worked for Planned Parenthood of North Central Indiana in the mid-1980s, traveling to area clinics, hiring staff, including a man, she pointed out, with the goal of ensuring that even poor women received high quality health care. In our conversation, Charlotte focused on the power of working one-on-one -on -one with people, appreciating the complexity in people's lives, and the importance of being able to make decisions about whether or when to have a baby. While black churches and social conservatism of many of the black families in South Bend in the 80s led to silencing around sex and reproduction, she said that one-on-one -on -one with patients at the Planned Parenthood clinic, people opened up and that she counseled people from the whole political spectrum and from a wide range of religious traditions. One-on-one, -on -one, she said, people are more complex than party or denomination platforms. 
of the messy, sometimes difficult, and sometimes uplifting stories she heard in those years. She said, if you could imagine it, it happened. She described the power of speaking respectfully with people who have different views, individually or in small groups, with rules and a structure for conversation. She urged us, don't give up on people, and fears that too often people in the pro-choice movement give up on those on the other side. Our conversation with Charlotte sparkled with warmth and laughter as she recounted the breakthroughs she had in those conversations. There was evident pleasure in this work. And I'll note here that while the majority of people in, U in the US express support for abortion access, they often do so with nuance about limits and situations, as do those who oppose the procedure. So it's actively unhelpful to imagine that there are clear sides on an issue where there's more overlap in opinion than we often hear. I think that's helpful. Somehow I'd forgotten Charlotte's call not to give up on people this past July when I attended with my spouse, Ken, the first Monday of the Indiana legislature's special session to, to decide on Indiana's abortion law. That first day, the ACLU organized a rally for pro-choice supporters. The mood was defiant, signs were sassy. One flower-crowned family held up a banner, three generations for choice. Speakers quoted June Jordan, one of my favorite essayists, and played girl power rock anthems. I had dozens of smiling conversations on the grassy grounds of the State House, trusting that these were my people. I felt as safe among them as I could, considering the inky slashes of SWAT team rifles visible in a nearby tower. So that was extremely unsettling, I gotta say. When we finally stre streamed indoors up the grand staircases of the State House to chant before the heavily carved doors of the Senate chamber, I felt like part of a thrumming organism. I caught sight of a few counter-protesters, their faintly waving anti-abortion signs swallowed up in our sea. I ignored them. We stayed overnight, and before we hit the road back to South Bend, I walked over to the State House to get a little more use out of my abortion is health care sign. As soon as I hoisted it and started circulating in the crowd, I realized my mistake. Tuesday's rally was organized by Right to Life and most of the people were wearing matching t-shirts with their slogans. I stuck out in my sundress and keen sandals, unexpectedly a lone counter-protester. I recognized one of the people I'd ignored the day before and I looked away. I kept circulating, stoic behind my N95 mask, calculating the wisdom of persisting. I think I texted Ken at that point. Holy shit. Um, I, think, I think I can say that if I say holy in front of it. Right, okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Unitarians. Um, so <laughs> I was heckled that morning and even hissed at. I didn't know people still did that uh, by a few people, but I was ignored by most. But then to my surprise, I got drawn into a real conversation. It started very badly with a red bearded and burly man calling out, hey, I wanna talk to you. I stared right past him. He dialed down his tone and followed me. No, really, explain your sign to me. So that was my sign that said abortion is healthcare. Did I trust him? Not really. But I did have something to say, and so I waved him around a wide marble column to muffle the chants from the crowd. I asked him what he thought about the 10-year-old from Ohio in the news just then who'd been cared for by an Indiana physician. He blanched. Oh, that poor girl. Yeah, that was a mercy. <laughs> Interesting. I asked him what he thought would lower the rate of unwanted pregnancies, and he said he wished Indiana had better sex ed and cheaper birth control, he said. Uh, people are, life is messy. I stopped looking at his beard and he seemed to stop looking at my mask and our eyes actually met. Well, I said, I agree with you there. I told him I was April from South Bend. I'm Dave, he said. You got a pretty place to camp up there. Potato Creek, real pretty. We talked about favorite walking trails for a few minutes, knuckle bumped and turned away, both of us shaking our heads. So that unexpectedly warm exchange, which I almost missed out on, is a good reminder of what can happen when we trust one another enough to have a conversation rather than just shouting slogans or chanting at one another. 
An article in this week's New York Times cited a US poll that found one in five people said political disagreements had hurt relationships with friends or family. 14% of voters said political views revealed a lot about whether someone is a good or bad person. So those feelings are barriers that tear at our democracy and the fabric of our daily lives. Nurturing relationships was a, was a theme in the next interview I'll talk about briefly with Dr. Ellen Stecker, who many of you know. She's a now retired white family physician who was active in starting a local chapter of the National Organization of Women in South Bend. And she's organized for reproductive freedom for most of her adult life. She's also just such an optimist. I just learn from her every, with every exchange. She's a Catholic by background and is able to connect respectfully with people of faith who oppose abortion but might support some kinds of family planning. Ellen warmly recounted helping to start and put together the citywide activist publication Around the Bend in the late 70s and early 80s, some of which are archived at the Civil Rights Heritage Center. And if you go to their website, you can see some of them online. The line drawings, the political cartoons are just, um, they're so of their moment, I'll just say, they're really a delight. In those pre-computer days, representatives from different groups, feminists, anti-war activists, environmentalists, typed up columns at home, handed them off to an editor for reproducing on a mimeograph machine, remember? <laughs> um, and then they held collating parties at someone's house. Pages were laid out on furniture and conversations crackled while people stacked, stapled, and addressed those newsletters for mailing. Food and music fostered friendships that ensured that groups advocated for one another. So this was before what some people have called sort of roguishly the ally industrial complex. <laughs> um, that's a little cynical, but you know, the, the word allyship I think wasn't really in use yet, but this is what they did. They learned what one another were doing and understood that if they wanted to build coalitions, uh, they needed to show up for one another and unsurprisingly friendships grow from those experiences. Leaning back to reflect at the end of that interview, Ellen told us with a big grin, one person can make a difference, but it's a whole heck of a lot easier to do with more people. It's also a lot more fun. So in my professional life this year, I'm working with incoming college students at IU South Bend who are still stumbling through social interactions after so much pandemic isolation. On one of the first days of class, I asked these students how many of them consider themselves to be introverts. Every single person, all 26, raised a hand. I waved my arms like a conductor, inviting them to take in the data in the room. See, I said, we're all in this weirdness together. They laughed, but nervously. In one-on-one -on -one conversations with them, which I require, teaching is not a democracy, <laughs> nearly every student confessed to having social anxiety. Many said they didn't know how to make friends, but they wanted to. I mean, it just tears at your heart. So these, you know, these young people are 17, 18. Just think about how much of their life, where we often, you know, how much of your teenage years are learning how relationships work, how they fail, how you recover from failure, and they just, they lost all that time. So while we're well into our semester at this point, we continue to start class with connection and conversation activities. I often ask students to count off into random small groups and ask them to find three things that they have in common in three minutes, extra, extra props for the more unusual commonalities. These serve as ongoing icebreakers, but they also help students see the value of finding common ground with those they don't yet know. There's also immeasurable value in communal laughter. As students discover they share a love of the same flavor-blasted snacks, brand of hot sauce, or have the same number of tattoos. I never ask, I, do, I don't pursue that one. It's like, oh, <laughs> interesting. Um, so those activities certainly take up time from my 75 minute class, but they're an investment in so much more than our class dynamic. We're relearning the pleasures of getting to know other humans. We're just as weird and complicated and vulnerable as we are, imagine. As we think about a path forward, not just for conversations about abortion, but for almost any divisive topic charged with fear right now, I want to conclude with some brief insights from writer Jonathan Haidt. That's H-A-I-D-T. So in his May 
2022 article for the Atlantic Monthly, he helps explain our, our current societal breakdown this way, and he sees this as unprecedented, as many people do. He says, social scientists have identified three major forces that collectively bind together successful democracies. Social capital, and that's extensive sec uh, social networks with high levels of trust, two, strong institutions, and three, shared stories. So Jonathan Haidt blames social media for weakening all three. As he says, quote, in 2009, shortly after its like button began to produce data about what best engaged its users, Facebook developed algorithms to bring each user the content most likely to generate a like or some other interaction. And this eventually included the share button as well. Later research showed that posts that trigger emotions, especially anger at outgroups, are the most likely to be shared. So those are not benign things that we do, uh, which I think most of us know, but this is extremely helpful to know that this is, the algorithm is designed um, to build on outrage. So Jonathan Haidt notes, quote, when Tocqueville toured the United States in the 1830s, he was impressed by the American habit of forming voluntary associations to fix local problems, rather than waiting for kings and nobles to act as Europeans would do. That habit is still with us today. In recent years, Americans have started hundreds of groups and organizations dedicated to building trust and friendships across the political divide. This is still Jonathan Haidt. We cannot expect Congress and the tech companies to save us. We must change ourselves and our communities." End quote. So I'm just finishing up here. So Jonathan Haidt's words make me think of my students and their increasing willingness to take the risk of finding common ground. I think, the war I think of the warmth and laughter that we hear in our oral history project as people reflect on what they've learned from others as they organize and the fun of a breakthrough with someone they may have given up on for a while. I think of Pete Buttigieg's latest book titled Trust, America's Best Chance. It's slim, I really recommend it. Um, in which he says, we'll have to work to cultivate trust, not only for national health, but for interpersonal happiness too. We have so much to learn simply from listening to the stories of the people all around us and creatively striving for common ground. We are one another's best hope if we can trust ourselves enough to make those connections. I am here for it, and I suspect you are, too. Thank you. So I'm happy to, to talk a little bit or to get the hook from Janiel. <laughs> we have just a couple of minutes for questions or comments. People, I know, I know you probably have a lot of thoughts, and April will stay with us for coffee yeah, time. Sure. Um, I read Buddha Judge's book, and I like you. I just trust is so critical. Yeah. Um, yeah. And we've had such a breakdown in that um, in Washington. It's it's really just hard to imagine how we can get that back. Hopefully, it'll come, but it's going to take a lot of time. There's been a lot of damage done. I agree. I agree. I mean, I think, though, just, you know, driving out here and seeing the yard signs um, just sort of reminds me how important it is, I guess, not to make assumptions about what motivates people to choose party and any of us who are part of groups where people vote in a wide variety of ways and it's harder and harder to find those spaces. So I think we need to actively seek them out. Um, most of us are more complicated than those slogans. So um, I appreciate the idea that you know, we've got work to do locally, but of course, the the political landscape is gerrymandered and it's difficult. April, thank you very much. Um, you know, it's been in my credo for a long time when I've written a credo, uh, and um, I'm not sure I always believe it anymore sometimes, but I always felt that if two people would sit and talk, for long enough, yeah. they would find that common ground. They would find, I don't think there's that many stories. There's some commonality mm -hmm. if we go deep enough with everybody. And mm -hmm. I'm not sure I always believe that anymore, but I used to believe that a lot. Mm -hmm. And thank you for yeah. your words. Yeah, thank you. Mary, we'll let you have the last word. 
<laughs> I have found that two people perceive the same action in different ways, mm -hmm. and that if you can talk, you might be able to resolve things. Yeah. But it also takes two that are willing. True enough. So yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. And I am happy to chat with people afterwards. Thanks for your time. Our closing hymn is Wake Now My Senses. And uh, Steve is going to lead us through this too. It's in the regular hymnal. It's been a little awkward um, with Lizzie playing when, with the benediction uh, standing and for the hymns and stuff. So could we remember t once we were done singing and the benediction, we can remain seated during the postlude and we can uh, appreciate that and then uh, close or leave after that. Um, just remember the verses three and four, four and five are on the second page. So you got to look, look across the page on the third and fourth verses, fourth and fifth verses. Stand if you're willing and able. benediction comes to us today from Frederick E. Gillis. May the love which overcomes all differences, which heals all wounds, which puts to flight all fears, which reconciles all who are separated, may this love be in us and among us now and always. <laughs> 